Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome to evening number. I'm reading a, an interesting article by a woman named Iris Young for peace study. It's called Throw Like a Girl, I think. Throw Like a Girl. Throwing Like a Girl, maybe. It's a very famous article. paper um, and the subject is about gender based on the premise that we treat genders differently we treat women different from we, the way we treat men in society and generally it's not a, an equal sort of a distinction so it's what we would call a sexist distinction where one of the genders is favored and given more and better opportunities than the other But what's interesting about the article, for me, or for a Buddhist and a meditator, is the way that it describes gender. It uh, talks about femininity. Why is it that why is it that women throw like a girl? It turns out it's not physical. Women are mostly physically as as capable as men, as men. But it's how they're taught and how they learn about and how they perceive gender, how they perceive themselves. She says that women are taught to taught to see themselves as objects, taught to see themselves as a thing, as as a, an object of action and not just actors, whereas men are taught that they are actors. They are given unlimited potential, and so they think of themselves mainly as the doer. As women are taught that they must also be observed and be aware of the fact that they will be observed and, and acted upon. And as a result, they uh, they generally fail to live up to their potential, at least physically. And so, because they they ha don't have the full confidence in their physical abilities, and for various reasons, they. They wind up throwing like a girl. So what makes it so interesting is how the how one's mental attitude how one's mental attitude can first be shaped by the environment, shaped by the society in which one lives, whereby we see that much of who we think is is who I am like my gender, winds up being a social construct, 
turns out that I don't have to throw like a girl just because I'm a girl and also what that then does what, what the our perception of gender then does to our, our uh, does to our bodies does to our experience how incredible it is that you can be crippled not by chains or prison, but you can be shackled by your own mind, which in turn is, is uh, conditioned by so many different things, including society. Meaning that we're not as free as we think we are, and we're not as real as we think we are. As human beings, our, our personalities are made up of little more than habits. There's very little about who we are that is immutable. To some extent, our, our, our physical gender, what they call the sex, is immutable. There are changes you can make, but you can't get rid of the, the uh, the distinction between chromosomes, chromosomes. To some extent, if you're born male, you're always going to be X, Y. If you're born female, you're always going to be Y, uh, Y, I think. Different chromosomes. And this is what Buddhism recognizes as gender. When we talk about gender, we are talking about a physical phenomenon a quality, a derived quality of matter. It doesn't actually exist, but if you if you examine matter, the, the human form, physical body, you will see that there is a gender distinction. Women have a, a feminine, a, the iti indriya, iti indriya, and men have the puris indriya. But how little what little meaning that actually has in our lives compared to how society defines and how we define and, and how we, we as individuals me, meaning you know society how we construct gender to the point that it becomes sexist and, and unequal and so on And so this points to our, our task in meditation. It's not just as simple as turning a switch and becoming enlightened. It's about deconstructing and, and, and working through and untying all these tangles that the Buddha talked about. Anto jata bahi jata. The inner tangle and the outer tangle. We're all tangled up inside with our own... Uh, phobias and, and neuroses and, and obsessions and addictions and aversions and so on. And we have the outer tangle influenced by the world around us. And we become very much akin to the people and the situations that we're surrounded by. Who we are, our personality isn't just because we decided, hey, I think I'll be this sort of person as much to do with the sort of people and the relationships we have with other people around us. And so I think it's it's quite apropos this this text. It's not something foreign to our, our it's, it's very much to do with our our uh, our task as meditators. Gender, the deconstruction of gender. I think this whole idea of um, gender identity, well, understandable, is is misguided, in the sense that people are trying to affirm their gender identity and they concern themselves a lot with gender identity. I mean, acknowledging the fact that some people who are physically male 
feel very female, feminine, They're very much like women, you know, mentally. And that some people who are born women feel very much like men mentally. And to acknowledge that is, is important. It's a curious and interesting phenomenon. In Buddhism, we would argue it. It's a part. It's another issue. I mean, part of this idea that yeah, we have, or we carry with us from life to life, some trace memories or, or um, inclinations based on our past lives. So if you've been born one gender for a long time and suddenly are born the other gender, it's going to feel pretty awkward and unf unfamiliar. It doesn't mean that you are mentally male or mentally female. It doesn't mean that there's any inherent uh, reality to the, the makeup of your of your mind. I think if anything, what you can see through meditation is that men and women become very similar. They lose a lot of that, not all generally, but they lose a lot of what makes them masculine or feminine. Except the physical, right? Besides looking like men and looking like women, mentally, they, this is something you see in the suttas often. Um, in regards to the bhikkhunis, Mara would often come to them and say, what, what, how can you become enlightened? You're just a woman with your two-finger wisdom. Two fingers is something to do with measuring or something. I don't know. There's some, some saying in India about two fingers is the wisdom of a woman because something to do with measuring, pinching rice or pinching spice or something. So that your wisdom is just knowing how to cook basically get back into the kitchen kind of thing. And they would say, for one who becomes, for one who sees clearly, where is their woman? So to be clear, this idea of, of gender identity is, is really just ego. It's, it's, it's problematic. You know? Not to say we shouldn't be compassionate and understanding of people who feel what we call gender dysphoria. I mean, this isn't about prejudice, but it's about understanding that identity and of any sort is not good. It's just a claim and it's nothing to do with gender. That's really the heart of what I'm pointing at here is that when we identify, when we, when we, when we, uh, reify something, we create, we ify, I don't know if there's even a word, but we turn a thing into an identity, into an entity. Right? I am male, I am female. And we identify with it. Then it becomes immutable, then it becomes real. And that the truth behind these things is that they're merely habits, they're merely a consequence of patterns of behavior, patterns of interaction, patterns of experience whereby we've been indoctrinated and cultured into believing we are this sort of person. This goes for everything. Gender is just a very curious and, and extreme example of it, but it goes with our habits of addiction and aversion, uh, our personality, everything that makes us who we are and, and that we identify with and say, yeah, that's me. And when people say that, oh, that that Yutta Dhammo, he's like this and like that, right? People think of me like this, think of me like that. All of us, we have this. So I, you build this up in in on the internet. You build up an internet personality here in Second Life. personality belief, sakaya diti. The idea that these things actually exist, that's wrong view. It's the first one of the first things to go with the experience and the realization of sotapana. Because once you've seen Nibbana, you realize none of this is actually uh, immutable. How it changes and the ways in which it changes is up for question, but that it changes is not up for question. Everything about who we are is 
just a consequence of our particular and, and exact position in samsara. There's nothing immutable or, or unchangeable or real about it beyond it being an experience and a sequence and a series and a, a pattern of experience that we have for a while and that changes over time and eventually fades away to be replaced by something else. So our job as meditators is really just to see through this so that we don't cling, so that we don't get attached to I am this, I am that, because when it changes we then aren't left in a lurch, uh, unable to cope. You know, because that's the thing, there are women who, who are able to free themselves from this oppressive um, prejudice and, and uh, the system of, of limiting one's potential by one's perceived gender, able to break free from it mentally, and though physically they're still women, and even though they may be subject to attacks and subject to discrimination, they can free themselves mentally of it and, and not have any sense, not, not suffer from it in the same way that one who takes it on and, and takes on a role, this curious role of femininity that makes one throw like a girl. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a silly example in Buddhism. We're not, none of us, I mean, I probably throw like a girl for what it's worth. But we become indoctrinated into thinking, I am this sort of person, I am that sort of person. You see this a lot. You see this a lot, I see this a lot in Asia, in more traditional societies. I don't see it quite so much in the West. Um, but in traditional, very traditional societies, it's blatantly obvious that men have specific roles, women have specific roles, and People are so brainwashed into thinking monks have specific roles. That's the worst. The roles that monks have been given is the one I felt most acutely because it didn't jive with my understanding of what a monk was. And I realized that this was culture. This is what culture is. It's the building up of construct. Some, some can be good. Some constructs are useful. But when the constructs replace reality, and when you take the constructs as being an ultimate, real, and important, and meaningful entity, then you've, got, you've fallen into wrong view. You've fallen into personality belief, that sort of thing. So it's quite simple. I mean, there's not a lot to say as meditators, but there's a lot of work to be done to deconstruct who we are. And the first step is making this shift, this realization that we're not a person, we're not a human, we're not a being, we don't have a personality. All we are is a hodgepodge, a mishmash, a mess of habits, mess of patterns of behavior that we've developed over time and that have been impressed upon us by our environment. And that's the most liberating, and that's the, 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 the primary liberating realization. It's not the end, of course, but it's what ignites the spark, the realization that I can change who I am. Who I am is changeable. I'm not stuck. I'm not doomed. I'm not re resigned to my fate. And all that comes next is trying to find the direction to go. Which way will I change myself? What is good about me? What is bad about me? Really, not because society tells me or not because I believe it, but what is really good and bad? And then it's about building the good and deconstructing the bad.
and leaving leaving alone which is neither good nor bad. So some thoughts on habits in general and personalities in general and gender in, in specific. It's an interesting topic. It's one that comes up a lot because uh, Buddhist cultures can be quite misogynistic as well. And Buddhism itself has some problems institutionally and even the texts have some dilemmas that we might very easily want to say are sexist and then we'd be like the Buddha couldn't be sexist, could he? And then we wonder, were these texts actually written by the Buddha? Or is there a way to explain them that makes them not sexist? Certainly we don't want to believe that the Buddha was sexist. It may very well be that the Buddha saw this was the state. If you want to try and excuse some of the gender disparity in Buddhism, even in the early texts. They say that he saw the state of women and thought mm, they do have special problems, as my Thai counter Thai monk friends explained to me. Women have special problems. I mean, it could be seen as true in a conventional sense that uh, in in cultural in traditional societies, women do have special problems that may make it harder for them to become enlightened. Hard to, hard to really be convinced by when men have their own special problems as well that make them far less, in many cases, inclined to meditate. So It's an interesting argument, though. Either way, gender is important, and it's important for us to be clear what we mean by it, that in Buddhism we don't have a sense that women are inherently different from men, besides the very, very small, insignificant fact that their bodies are a little bit different, men's bodies, women's bodies, but it's only physical. Mentally, mentally it depends on the individual. It depends on the culture, it depends on the circumstance, which can be changed and should be understood to be mutable, changeable. So, there you go. Some thoughts, some dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.